Hello, my name is Robin Mitchell and this is Mega.io. In today's video, we're going to learn about turning the Raspberry Pi into an IoT device. Now, a lot of projects out there will have you using these as web servers or as, as some form of computational device or a network storage device, but they can operate as an IoT device as well. And there are quite a few advantages of doing this. And one of them could be, for example, you get a lot more processing capability uh, and hardware capability. So for example, you could connect these to cameras and displays. Uh, human interface devices quite easily and get an IoT device that has a wide range of inputs. So how do we do it? Well the first thing we're going to talk about is the language that we're going to use. Now there are a lot of languages you can program the Pi in including C, C++ and Java but the one we're going to go for in this example is Python and the reason for this is because arguably Python is pretty superior in this area. Now, of course, C and C++ are compiled languages. They're very, very fast and you can process lots of data there. And there is no argument about that. And Java has its cross-platform nature, which makes it very, very appealing. And it's also a very commonly used language. But Python, for me, when it comes to the Pi, is the easiest language to use. Mainly because running Python or running Python programs on a Pi is done through a terminal very, very simply. And the Python programs are almost always cross-platform and I just tend to like the flow of Python. So before we go ahead and program the Raspberry Pi, we're gonna have a quick look at code organization. Now, up till now, we tend to stick all our code into the same file and it works for small projects, but when you get bigger projects or you want to recycle code, it gets a little difficult. So here we're gonna be talking about file organization in coding. Now, the best thing you can do in these situations is to try and organize code into different files under different functions. For example, if you have a class, uh, you know, a specific type of class, maybe that class could be something to do with uh, working with cameras and you wanna keep it in its own file, in its own directory, if you can, with some kind of documentation about the code, how it works and how you can implement it when you wanna use it later on. Because you may remember how the code works tomorrow after writing it today, but in a month's time or a year's time, you may forget. So you don't wanna to have to rewrite the whole thing or try and figure out how it works. Now, when it comes to writing IoT code, it's best to block this up into three main areas. Uh, the actual functional code, which does the sensor processing, the Wi-Fi code, which connects it to a Wi-Fi network, and then the server code, which is how it interacts with the server. Now, these three main blocks uh, should be separated as three blocks uh, using commonly named functions because when you wanna transfer your code to a different platform or you wanna upgrade a system which may, which, which may work differently, it becomes a lot easier to adapt the code. If all the code is spaghettied into one big file and you try and rewrite things every time you add new hardware, it gets very complicated. But by doing this, you only have to describe three main functions and they can work differently on any system. As long as they produce the same result, that's all that matters. So one simple example of why this could be useful is that in our example, we're gonna be connecting our Raspberry Pi to the IoT dashboard system we've been designing for the past few uh, videos and how to's. Um, but what if we decided to use MQTT on a completely different service? Well, if your code is spread out and sectionized properly, we can just, or we only have to adjust the server code, nothing else. The functional code's still the same because it's still sending the same data or processing the same data. And the Wi-Fi code hasn't changed because it's still connected to the same Wi-Fi. So the code you see on the screen right now is all of the code for this IoT example written in Python. Now we've kept it in one file to make things simpler, but when you do implement or do decide to use the Raspberry Pi for IoT projects in Python, please consider splitting the files up and creating sort of some sort some form of organization around this. Now you'll see at the top of the code we have a uh, device key uh, variable, and this is used commonly by both functions, the get variable and the set variable, because as we described earlier in a how-to, we implemented an API key feature on our IT dashboard, so only valid devices can communicate with the server. And then we also define a variable called host, and this is the IP address of our local area networked server. The IoT set variable function is very simple, only needs a variable name and a variable value. Now the core of the code in these functions is put into a try block and the reason is that if anything goes wrong, it doesn't crash the program. And try except blocks can be very useful in situations which may crash frequently, such as the server no longer exists, the connection's broken, or there's been some invalid data. And exactly the same goes for the IoT get variable function. Again, we only pass a single string and what this does is it, re it returns the value of the variable that we've defined or passed into the function. And again, all of the core code is in a try block so that if anything goes wrong, we at least get an exception error and we can handle that as opposed to just crashing the program outright. 
and in the main program loop it's incredibly simple all we're doing is just saving the value of the GPIO states which can be changed to actually read the GPIO value but here we're just using it as an example and then we can grab the and then we can actually set the value of the GPIO by using the get variable function and you can see how trivial our main program loop is because once the get and set variable functions are defined we no longer need to worry about them and our code becomes incredibly readable and very easily adjustable. So that's all we have time for today in this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.